Um, I'm very um, um, honoured to be asked to give this little talk to you. Um, I know a couple of you um, and uh, it's really a privilege to share some of our experiences with you in your challenge in the, in the industry. I'll make this comment now and I'll probably get back to it at the end. Um, I've had a chance to look through your roadmap documents and I think it's a fair thing to say that uh, while you might think of the Australian sheep industry as really different from uh, the United States, um, there's a lot of things that you're trying to do that we are still trying to do and certainly that we were focused on back in the uh, 1980s and 1990s which is really the period I'm going to concentrate on. So there's a lot of uh, actual similar challenges and I so I hope some of the things I have to say are at least a bit of a guide to some things you could try out. Um, so uh, and just to repeat Susan's point if people uh, put questions into the chat room while we're going I'll try and keep an eye on that um, and uh, speak to them and uh, I understand Reed is going to be doing uh, keeping an eye on them as well and if he can help he will and I'm happy to take questions at the end if we can organise that as well. So here I go. Um, I won't spend much time on my who I am. I think the, the key point is um, I was appointed as the National Coordinator of Land Plan back in 1988, um, which was to set Land Plan up and get it going as a, a national sheep improvement program. And I did that for a number of years. Particularly through the 1990s, um, our industry had a, 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 a major program of coordinated R&D and extension, which I'll be talking about, and land plan was an integral part of that, and I think we'll, we'll touch on what the contributions were and so forth um, as we go through. But the, the real point is that I think that's, that's the big thing of my experience that I hope is of relevance and interest to you. Everything else kind of built on that. Um, but that's, that's really where I was very heavily involved in lamb industry um, strategy and development in this country. Um, I will basically work through fairly simple stages here. Um, I want to start by talking about what the industry was doing basically in the period up to around 1990, then talk about what changes have been, have been achieved then I want to say a little bit about how those changes were made and then really just touch on, I guess, some general reflections or suggestions that you might want to think about. Um, so, and, and I'm really kind of concentrating on the, on the process of the change itself. I'm not going to tell you much about the lamb industry in Australia today. I'm really going to talk about how um, a lot of things came together to turn around the fortunes of the industry uh, over about a 10 or 15 year period. So in the period up until 1990, the uh, lamb production in Australia was very, very much a byproduct of the wool industry. So we have, a, we have a very large wool industry in this country. At various times, there's been up to 100 million ewes, um, basically merino ewes producing wool, and obviously they're probably producing wool. And lamb was very much a byproduct, and it was um, uh, pretty much... Uh, merino lambs uh, with some crosses. The, in that period through to about 1990 the real price, that's the price that the producer was receiving adjusted for inflation was declining and I think we'll be looking at that in just a minute and increasingly uh, it became clear that the product didn't have any uh, consumer appeal. Um, the, it's very simple, there was too much fat and too little meat and the industry also was in terms of the meat industry, was very um, had very limited exports, um, and they tended to be f to fairly low value markets. We were completely different from New Zealand, who had a, had and continue to have a very strong market in the UK. Um, Australia didn't really feed into that market at all, and didn't have much other exports uh, as well. And there really wasn't very much research and development going on in the industry. It was very small scale. So it was, it was pretty much going nowhere or, in fact, going backwards. So that's up until about 1990. And the, 
The slide I've got on the screen really just tries to highlight that point about the consumer appeal. Um, this is a picture taken more recently, but the chops on the right, these are uh, land cuplocks, I guess you'd call them. The ones on the right are representative of 1990s genetics, and um, they're very unappealing, as I'm sure you'll agree. Um, there's too much fat, the muscle's too small. The ones on the left have got somewhat larger eye muscle. Um, there's some trimming, but uh, they're just a, a different product. The ones on the right are representative of kind of 1990s genetics. And the market research that was conducted through the 1980s, there was a small amount of it, basically said people just did not like lamb and they were liking it less and less. So that's a fairly simple, um, stark message. And um, so basically through the second half of the 1980s, a whole range of things started to happen that led to um, the industry kind of getting its act together and I'll talk about some of those things in a minute but the change is what I really want to, to start with um, because it's really quite profound, quite remarkable, quite big. Since 1990 um, we've had steadily rising carcass weight um, and real price and export volume and really what I want to do is just talk about what helped that to occur. So the starting point there is basically up to 1990 or thereabouts, things were going backwards. Everything, uh, income, etc., was declining from about 1990 onwards. It started improving. Um, and there has been really quite remarkable change in the carcasses. And I think this is kind of the fundamental central point of what's happened. Everything else flows from it. Um, if you look in the bottom part of this picture, there's a picture of a typical sort of 1980s type lamb. Our lambs in those days averaged uh, 38 and a half pounds slaughter weight, and they certainly had too much fat. Um, they even at that weight, they tended to be mostly what we call three and four score and even five score. Today, our average carcass weight in this country is up over about 48 to 50 pounds. And the fat coverage is either, on average, has probably not changed much, but there's a lot of carcasses that are a lot leaner. So um, we've got the capacity now to produce much, much heavier carcasses with the same amount or less fat as was in the carcass back um, 20 or more years ago. And uh, I think that's kind of the fundamental thing that's been done. It's now I'm going to talk a little bit about how we, how we went about doing it, I guess. Um, just to reinforce the point about uh, the income uh, side of the industry, this chart is just telling you the, the gross value of production just means the total value of production, the farm gate value of production of the industry, and it's in real terms, so it's been adjusted for inflation, and I'm covering here the period from 19, early 1980s to the early 2000s. The part of the chart that's in red is, ba is basically before 1991. And I think you can see that the trend line there was going downwards um, and that was, it was declining in real terms by $17 million a year. Now that income is spread over about 50,000 producers, I guess you'd say. Um, so someone who's online can do the maths and work out what 17 million divided by 50,000 is. And that tells you how much money, how much producer's income was going backwards on a per producer basis. I think it's about $3,000 a year off the top of my head. So in the period leading up to 1990, producer's income and industry income was going backwards in real terms. You can see that through the 90s, that was turned around. Real income was then growing by about $19 million a year. And... In the period since the 2000s, and I apologise, I haven't brought this graph right up to the present date, but the real income of the industry has been growing by, um, it's well over $200 million a year in real terms now. So that's, and that's largely the value. The, the total production in terms of numbers of animals hasn't changed a great deal. The carcass weight's gone up and the value has gone up. And so... Um, 
that's really just to try and reinforce that something real, uh, something of value to ordinary people like yourself has happened uh, in our lamb industry um, in that period. And the change, the, 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 the change point really was about 1990, 1991. So how did that get done? Um, the most important thing, I think, is first of all that the industry decided to do something about meeting consumer demands. Um, remember I said a couple of slides ago that there was market research through the 1980s uh, that was saying that consumers didn't like the product very much, it was too fat and there was not enough meat. The problem was through that period nobody really did anything about it. They sort of said, well, okay, the consumers don't like the product. Um, and with respect to marketing colleagues, we'll try marketing in a different way and, you know, that just doesn't work. So really what happened was people started to say, we are going to do something about meeting consumer demands. And the industry put together a, a coordinated program of research and development and extension that tried to explore all the ways that, one, that producers could use to produce larger and leaner lambs. It was basically called a large lean lamb program. And I really stress here, that that program of research and development and extension included both genetics and also uh, non-genetics. So, and I'll touch on that in a minute. But it wasn't just a genetics program, although I think you'll see that that was pretty integral to it. But it was a whole of industry um, approach to understanding how to produce lambs that were larger, so they had more meat and less fat. Um, and there was a, that coordinated program of R&D really ran through basically the 1990s. There was a, a solid um, single program, essentially. In terms of uh, the industry implementation of it, the two things really are that Land Plan was initiated. Uh, Land Plan started in 1988, but really got going when it was part of this thing called the Prime Lamb Key Program. Um, the Prime Lamb Key Program was managed by our industry checkoff organisation, which in those days was the Meat Research Corporation. So uh, they collect, or government collects, funds from uh, production, or from producers basically, and uh, those funds are allocated to research and the government matches them up to a particular level. And a significant chunk of the land money that was collected for that in that way was applied through this large coordinated prime lamb key program. From memory, back in the 90s, I suspect that was a total spend per year of somewhere around three to five million dollars of research and development extension, which was a lot of money for the industry in those days. But the important thing was that it was, it was put together in a single coordinated program um, so that all the projects were uh, kind of linked to a common goal which was production of large lean lamb, um, profitable production of large lean lamb. And, and the genetics program lamb plan was a part of that. And the other thing which I think is important was that increasingly through the 1990s, the planning of research and development and the planning of marketing activity became better and better uh, aligned with each other. I said earlier that um, there was market research in the 1980s that said you know, consumers didn't like uh, fatty lamb. And in that, in that period of time, there wasn't very good coordination. So the people would go off and do marketing programs and have um, some photos of nice lean chops and, and, uh, and push that product. But there wasn't any of the product in the shops because nobody was able to produce it. So that was very poor coordination of marketing and R&D and production. So what happened in the 1990s was that the marketing and the production arms really started to forward plan together much, much more than had been the case previously. Yep, okay, I'll keep going. So um, just to remind everybody, all I'd done was started talking about how the change was made and I think back in the 90s, this is what we're talking about. And the, I think the point I really wanted to stress was that there was a whole of industry 
program of R&D and extension put in place that looked at both genetic and non-genetic approaches to meeting consumer demands, as I've said on the screen there. Uh, it was a fairly substantial investment for the lamb industry at the time. I suspect from memory it was of the order of three to five million dollars total program investment per year. And the other, and it lasted for basically six or seven years in total. And there was in, increasing improvement of the coordination between the R&D activities, which were managed by the Meat Research Corporation, and marketing, which was managed by a separate organisation in this country. So um, I think that's, that's describing the program, uh, the sorts of activities that went on. Let me now just uh, concentrate on some of the specific things that happened. And I, I'm going to concentrate on genetics, partly because this is a NSIP type audience, partly because that's what I know something about, and partly because I think uh, genetics was actually the kind of trigger point for everything else. Um, there was lots of good effort in lots of areas, but without genetic change, it, sim it, it I don't think it would have had the same effect. And i try to capture that in a couple of very simple slides. Um, there's lots of material that could be showed on this, but it really it's just about what genetic change happened in the key breeds and populations that were contributing to our lamb industry. And I've started off with some genetic trends for uh, two or three traits in the Pole Dorset breed. Um, they are a significant uh, terminal sire breed in our country. We have a we tend to use crossbreeding for uh, uh, lamb, slaughter lamb production. So it's typically a terminal sire joined to either a dual purpose breed sheep like a Corridal or joined to a Merino or sometimes joined to crossbred ewes which are in our country are typically borderless to Merino crosses. Now I won't go into any further detail about the, that overall production system. The key point is we started to have genetic change in the in the various breeds contributing to the industry and the, it really started off focusing on the terminal sire breeds and uh, in our country were pole dorsets and white suffolks and suffolks and some others. So I'm just really just going to concentrate on um, the sorts of genetic changes we've seen and this slide that's on the screen at the moment is the genetic trend in uh, the trait called post weaning weight which is about eight month weight um, the vertical scale is in kilograms, so you can approximately double that for pounds. So that's the animal's weight at uh, basically eight months. Uh, you can see the years along the bottom. And the trend line, if we just concentrate on the uh, black squares for a moment, that's the whole breed genetic trend. And you can see that basically since the, this goes back to the mid-90s, um, there's basically been about 12 kilos, which is close to 27, 28 pounds added to the weight of uh, pole dorset animals at a constant age, in other words, about eight months. And approximately half of that is passed on to their slaughter progeny. So that's how we've added something like 12 pounds to the slaughter, slaughter weight of our lambs at the same age um, over that period of time. I haven't actually got a chart here showing what the genetic trend is going back to, into the 1980s. We do have those charts. We, we can do that. And it's, it's extremely clear for this trait and basically all the others, there was essentially no genetic change happening before about 1990. Um, and I don't think it's any accident that that's when that's because that's when lamb plans started. Essentially, there was no genetic change going on in our lamb industry before 1990. Since that time, there's been substantial change. So that trait that we're just looking at is post weaning weight. Um, you could see the little red, I think they're diamonds, those shapes, and it says meat elite beside it. Now, uh, there'll be two or three graphs with this, uh, charts with this, um, both these lines. Uh, meat elite is a a group of pole dorsal breeders in this country, um, there's about 20 or 25 of them, who've been working a cooperative uh, breeding program for pretty much since about the mid-90s. 
It's very simple. They simply share some young sires through AI each year, but I've put them in the chart firstly because I think it highlights something that uh, small breeders can do working together. Um, it's fairly simple to make plenty of genetic progress if you coordinate your activities a little bit. Um, it doesn't require very much change to the individ what each individual is doing. Um, Reed might, if Reed's interested to follow up later, I can provide some documentation about how that program and other similar ones are structured. But I just, it's, it's an interesting point. You can see they've actually made faster genetic progress than the breed as a whole, and they've done it without really changing what, they haven't, it, it hasn't been a big extra investment they've had to make. They're simply using some AI, they were already using some AI, and they just use it in an organised way and they've been able to make even more progress than the Dorset breed as a whole. But the key point there, you can see there's something like 12 kilos added live weight at, the, at constant age, roughly 27, 28 uh, pounds at constant age, added to that terminal sire breed over the, over the period up to about 2008. If we then look at um, the other two traits that was real focus on, um, over the same period of time, and we're talking about fat, so that's fat cover um, at, at the, the weight they've been measured, so basically at um, about eight months, and the eye muscle depth, so PFAT is the fat and PEMD is eye muscle depth. Um, those, I'm sure those of you who are using NSI, NSIP will be familiar with that. The, um, the key point there is, if we just selected for growth rate, so just going back to this previous slide, if we'd selected for growth rate, uh, we certainly would have been able to improve growth rate and, and weight at constant age, um, and we did, but if we'd simply concentrated on growth rate, the animals would have actually got fatter as they got heavier, and that wouldn't have solved that problem about um, the consumers wanting more meat and less fat. So a key feature of land plan, and I'm sure you're familiar with this all along, has been using information on the fat scan and the muscle scan to help manage those two traits at, at the same time as making genetic progress in, uh, in growth rate. And you can see on this chart that, I don't know whether you can see my point of it anyway, the upper pair of lines is the trend for eye muscle depth. So over that period of that uh, 10 years or so, um, eye muscle depth was being increased at constant weight. So the animals were being bred to be more muscly as well as simply being bigger. And that's the chart of the blue triangles. And the other line on the chart is the, the trend relating to fat. And you can see that that's been going down. So uh, over that period of time, the fat at constant weight was being reduced despite the fact that the animals were being selected to be faster growing, to be heavier. So lamb plan allowed people to breed animals which grew faster, grew bigger, grew m significantly more muscly, but at the same time became less fat. And normally you, you, you could not do that simply by, by picking the big ones. If you pick the big ones, the, the fat at constant weight would not change or it would actually go up. So it's absolutely critical that lamb plan was being used in the pole dorsa breed and other breeds to kind of break that nexus between growth and fat. And so we were able to breed sheep that uh, their lambs grew faster, they grew to heavier weights, they had more muscle and they had less fat and so they were moving in the direction of meeting the consumer requirements um, better and better. Now that period, that snapshot that is there is roughly a 10 year period. Um, I haven't shown the chart here, but I'll say it again. If we go back to pre-1990, there was no genetic trend for any of those traits whatsoever. And it's, the, it's very clear the genetic, the genetic progress really started just after land plan started, about 1990, 1991. And it's been pretty steady at these sorts of rates, uh, in the terminal sire breeds at least, ever since. And it's absolutely fundamental that that changed the lambs we were able to produce in this country. 
we could now breed lambs that can be taken out to heavier weights without becoming over fat and they actually had better yielding carcasses. The muscle, um, the, the muscle cuts were bigger and uh, there was less fat associated with that. So all moving in the direction of the, what the consumer wanted. And a nice way to show that in terms of our various markets is this, particular, this next slide. Um, all it's doing is showing for Australian lamb markets um, how they fit in terms of carcass weight and uh, the fat depth. The vertical axis here is simply uh, how fat the carcasses are. It's using a measure we have in this country called the GR fat depth, which is the depth of tissue um, 110 millimetres out from the backbone at the 12th, 13th rib. So it's kind of at the uh, out on the the sort of thin part of a couplet, if you um, can picture that in your mind. It's, there's, it's actually a combination of lean tissue and fat, but it's a good indication of overall fatness in the carcass. So this scale here is um, fatness getting higher, and this is carcass weight getting higher. And you can see that our kind of standard lamb we use in this country now, we call trade lamb, that's for the domestic market, goes through our supermarkets and so forth. Its uh, specifications are basically 15 or so, or 17 or so through, say, 23 kilo carcass weight, 5 to, 10, uh, 5 to 15 mils GR. Food service, that's restaurants and so forth, they tend to want a little bit heavier weight with no more fat, so that's that area there. Our export lamps, particularly heavy export um, to North America, to Asia, to Europe, they'll be heavier weights again little bit more um, uh, fat can be carried in those lambs, particularly when they're heavier. And we also have a market in the Middle East for lighter and leaner lambs. Now, that's just describing the various markets that Australian lamb tend to be produced for. And the next uh, slide is going to show you how the, the, the genetics have changed and meet those markets better. The first point is, if we took traditional lambs, so this is back 1990, and we, we looked at their weight and fat at, as, they get, as they grow to uh, market age. This, this blue line tells you what sort of fat-weight combination to expect. And so typically um, back when lamb plant started, 1990, about here, round about here, is what the traditional lamb in those days was, was uh, averaging. Roughly about 17 and a half uh, kilograms carcass weight. I can't remember what that is in pounds, but um, the high 30s. And it was about 10 to 12 mils GR, which is essentially a three score lamb, we called them in those days in this country. And that's what our traditional genetics would do. And if we grew the lambs out to, make, to get heavier carcasses, you can see the fat um, started to be outside the range of what was acceptable to um, the markets even back then. So once you took those lambs back 25 years ago, past about 20 kilos, they were just too fat by far and nobody wanted them. So traditional genetics was okay for this sort of product, but completely useless for anything out here. And so what we've tended to do through genetics is breed animals, well, just call them balanced modern genetics. Um, it's really making the point that the growth rate and the carcass, the fat and the muscle are in line. Those animals now have a growth curve which basically takes them through all our markets on average. So if you want to turn them off light, around about 20 kilos, um, and I'm sorry I'm not converting to pounds as I go, but I think that's about 44 pounds, they'll meet the trade lamb specifications for our normal, ordinary domestic market. You take them a bit heavier, they'll meet the food service market. You take them even heavier and they're just really good for a range of heavy export markets. So that's what balance, our balanced, typical, modern terminal side genetics will breed. And just going back to stress the point, the genetics we had 25 years ago were quite okay for the trade land market then, but if you took them to a bit heavier weights, they were completely useless. Too fat, people didn't want them and hopeless for the export market. Today's lambs, there's a lot more flexibility for the producer um, in terms of turning them off and a lot more um, flexibility 
for um, someone like the feeder, those people can uh, take lambs to heavier weights and they're not going to go out to fat, over fat. And the, it means also the retailers or the exporters who've got a lot more capacity to buy lambs at different weights and meet them, match them to more, um, more different markets. And I'd have, it's not, everything's not perfect. There are certainly some animals that are being bred in this country that have got very high EBVs, particularly for post weaning weight. Um, so they're right out, the, they're very high growth animals. They, some of them tend to be very lean. Um, they'll take you even further in this dimension. They'll take even more fat off. There is a risk with those, these sorts of lambs. So this is very high post weaning weight EBVs and significantly negative post, uh, P fat EBVs. Those animals really are much, much better suited to, la to breeding lambs that will be, will be grown out to heavy weights. If they're turned off at light weights down here at the sort of 20 kilos, there's very often a risk that they'll be, they won't be finished. They won't have enough fat cover. So people are breeding this sort of la um, uh, animal, but it's really suited to the feeder market and the heavy weights. So people who want to put lambs on feed for uh, any longer than very short periods of time, they can, they can buy genetics that will do that, but it's not, it's, it's not for all markets. Um, so just, I just want to stress that point quickly and I'll, I'll read the, um, um, the questions while I'm doing it. Just to go back, that was all about genetics, just to let me reiterate. Genetics was absolutely fundamental in changing the sort of lamb we could produce in this country. And that was because there was a combination of genetic improvement of growth rate and weight at constant age, and at the same time improving muscle and reducing fat. And the, the net result of that was to get us to a situation where the modern lamb in Australia, the, the, the animal being bred by particularly our terminal sires, is, is suited to being able to be turned off at quite a, different, a, a wide range of weights and can meet even the heavy markets uh, where they've got to have heavy carcasses and, and still limited fat. And in, indeed, there are some genotypes that can be, can be taken well out towards 30 kilos or beyond. And 30 kilos must be something like 65 kilo carcass weights, uh, 65 pound carcass weights. So we've got genetics in this country now that can produce a, a lamb with very uh, okay fat cover, still down around 10, 12 mils of GR and up around the 65 pounds mark. And that means there's enormous flexibility for the packer and the retailer because there's just plenty of meat. The cuts are nice and big, they're attractive, you can turn them into all sorts of things and you're not cutting off wasty fat. Now, um, just quickly checking the questions. Yeah, no, that's that's fine. Reed and Cody have just commented on meat elite and um, GR. Would I comment on this increase in weight? Um, Jim's question about whether the increase in weight would have been and uh, increase in muscle and decrease in fat would have been possible without EBVs. The answer is very simply no. It's completely impossible because uh, if you select animals just just based on their weight or even by eye you're going to tend to get growth and fat going or weight and fat going up together and you might make some improvement in muscle but you'll get a lot of lot more fat with it ebvs make it possible to move those three traits in the directions you want and that's exactly what the industry did in this country so i i think it's quite a reasonable thing to, to claim that uh changing the product was the absolute number one thing that had to be done and that could not be done without genetics and Lamplan was the tool that breeders used to make those changes. So moving on, um, just I just want to briefly touch on the sorts of other work that was done through that R&D and extension program back through the 90s. Um, it, one thing that uh, was particularly important People needed to uh, have the flexibility to take lambs out to heavier weights, basically to have the feeding systems there to do it. We tend not to have very much um, what we call feedlots 
um, where lambs are, are yarded and, and provided with um, concentrate or roughage rations. Um, Feedlotting is a very, very small part of the Australian industry and it was virtually non-existent back in uh, the 90s. So when I say f uh, finishing systems, it's, it's making sure there are things like fodder crops or pasture crops that would grow, would extend the growing season. So you could keep lambs longer to let them get to those heavier weights. And there's quite a lot of good work done on, on different uh, fodder crops, brassicas, um, strategic use of alfalfa, that sort of thing. So that rather than just relying on sort of the natural spring growth and turning the lambs off in the, in the time the green grass was around, people developed a range of ways to provide feed to lambs to keep them growing out in the, in the field. Um, I'm not going to talk about feedlotting very much, but certainly feedlotting has, has started a bit in Australia, but it's I, nothing like the scale you have in, the, in uh, North America. So finishing systems was one area of research um, that was conducted. For a while there was a lot of interest in the use of um, crypt orchid lambs. Um, which are basically animals that are not castrated, but the testes are uh, sort of forced up into the abdominal cavity. Um, so they retain the leanness advantage of um, entire males. That was quite widely trialled, um, particularly in the early 1990s, but um, it's not taken off um, basically for two reasons. You end up with some behavioural issues with the animals and they require a bit more careful handling in terms of feeding and so forth. And there were some issues with uh, dark cutting and eat quali eating quality. So cryptos, crypt orchids were, were trialled but they never really took off. And it's, it's a nice way of thinking about genetics is that genetics made ordinary lambs, i.e. castrated lambs, have the performance characteristics of um, crypt orchids but without any of the behavioural or eating quality problems. So that was another area of research. Enormous amount of work went into working with uh, butchers to work out ways to get more value out of the um, carcasses as they became uh, larger and had less fat. Uh, some of the traditional cuts became less and less viable for the butchers, but there was more meat to play with, basically. So part of that overall integrated um, R&D and extension and marketing program was working very, very closely with retail butchers to help them work out ways to get as much value as possible out of the, the heavier carcasses. And that's certainly very, very successful if you go into our supermarkets and, and restaurants and so forth these days. Yes, you can get traditional cuts like uh, chops and so forth, but there's lots and lots of other um, uh, product offerings uh, that particularly that are completely lean meat. So um, just lean meat cuts of one form or another. It's much, much nicer for the consumer. And the last point I'm touching on there is the supply chain alliance. And this gets back to something that was raised in... Um, some of the background discussions for this webinar is how do we go about trying to make sure everybody got some value from the changes. Um, and I'd like to stress we, we have essentially no vertical integration in the Australian lamb industry at all. Um, there are not uh, packers, for instance, owning feeding, system, feeding, um, feeding operations. There are not packers owning breeding operations, etc. Um, and so that whole business of selling lambs through the, through the supply chain all the way to the consumer and what sort of signals come back was a problem and it, to some extent it still is. It's, a, it's not an easy problem to overcome. But one of the things that was trialled in the, particularly through the 90s, there was lots of work done in this area of essentially getting groups of producers working together with uh, processors and e even with butchers to actually um, start guaranteeing the supply of large lean lambs and, and making sure the retailer knew they were going to get them in the volume they wanted so they could start passing back some, uh, some reward to the producers for producing those lambs. So rather than simply putting them into the open auction where very often the price signals get uh, lost, there was a lot of effort 
to actually help people make connections through the supply chain and, and turn those uh, connections into direct uh, ongoing business relationships. Not all of those have survived and stood the test of time, but there certainly are some that have. And in general, they've helped, if you like, the processor and the retailer to, to learn and to be confident that they can get more valuable lambs. There are ways to do it. Um, there are groups of producers who are working with breeders to make sure they're using the right sort of genetics. So some of it's formal business relationships, some of it's just industry knowledge that people know they can get those lambs and that they can pass some reward back to the producer to do it. I'd really stress there's no simple um, way of achieving that. There's no sort of magical off-the-shelf solution. That's lots and lots of work went into that of uh, people that were called product development officers, working with producers, with breeders, with the, the processors and the retailers, helping people learn that, yes, the larger leaner lambs could be produced, they could be produced in reasonable volume, that the producer needed some return for those, the ex, you know, there were some extra costs in that, and they needed to be rewarded for the superiority of the product. So by building those relationships, which by and large I suspect in the main have been informal, people have, have improved that, under, that through chain understanding and they've improved the returns coming back to the producer. Um, sorry about that, I just lost my screen. And if I just quickly go back, um, I promise I won't do this very much. Where did it get to? This chart which I touched on much earlier um, talks about gross value of production to, uh, for the industry. That's gross value of production at farm gate. And I told you that there, was, there hasn't been very much change in the numbers of lambs being produced. I think it's gone up by about 5 or 10%. But the returns, particularly in the period since about 2000, have been growing. And they've been growing because the lambs have been getting larger and leaner. There's more value in those and the producers are getting substantially bigger money for lambs than they were in those days. The real price of lamb today is double what it was, and this is the price to the, to the producer. The real price of lamb to the producer is now double what it was in 1990. And so this issue of, just going back to where I was, this issue of the benefits flowing back through the chain has certainly, it's certainly occurred. It's not necessarily that each lamb is being paid for exactly its lean yield, lean yield content, for instance, although there are one or two supply chains doing that. But in general, as the value of lambs has gone up, the lamb producer has got a substantially better return um, because the consumer is getting a product. So this whole thing of supply chain alliance development, it's worth really thinking hard about how you might go about doing that. It's not something where you can change the world overnight. It's, it's sort of a long, hard slog, but it appears to have paid off in this country because pro the, the lamb producer, the ordinary lamb producer, is getting approximately double the money in real terms per kilo as to what they were 25 years ago. The question was just put up there from Susan, has the trend on um, increase in weight and muscle and decrease in fat continued through to now? Yes, it has. It's, it's sort of a straight line. It's actually probably getting a little bit faster. Um, in recent years, as, as basically people have just got better and better at recording and using the information. And I'll touch on that in just a second. Um, so that was that question. So I just want to leave you with that, this slide about non-genetic R&D and extension. In hindsight, you can look at it that there was lots of work done in t that ultimately has told us what do we need to do to get the best out of the improving genetics. If we just changed genetics on its own, I'm sure there would have been some benefits. But by doing this work on things like finishing systems, the new cuts, supply chains and, and other uh, work which I haven't put on the slide, it's helped each part of the chain to understand how to get the value out of the better genetics. 
So you get this nice feedback between improving the genetics and improving uh, the management of the genetics and that pays off for everybody through the chain. Um, just a couple of slides to finish off with now. First of all, where are we today? Um, producer returns, lamb is now, it's currently over $5 a kilo Australian. Um, so whatever that is, that's about $12 a pound, I guess. And as I said, that's approximately, that's roughly double in real terms what it was back in uh, 25 years ago. Uh, lambs are selling for upwards of 7500 bucks. Um, that's returned to the producer. The R&D that we're working on now days is very increasingly focused on uh, managing the eating quality of the lambs, um, making sure things like their iron and zinc content are being maintained, making sure that the intramuscular fat is at the levels that the consumer wants and that it doesn't drop back because animals are getting leaner. And uh, we've got big programs that are concentrating on uh, understanding the genetics of that and providing breeding values to um, back to the breeders uh, for intramuscular fat. And some of you may be aware that um, there are uh, there are certainly sheep on the Lamplam website that now have uh, breeding values for eating quality and I think it's for intramuscular fat and also for lean meat yield. Well, that's a, an outcome of that sort of, e of research. That's increasingly um, now using DNA testing as part of the overall program um, so that breeders can take a blood test of uh, the young rams or ewes and um, uh, use that, uh, the genotype from that to get an EBV for eating quality and intramuscular fat. There's a whole bunch of other traits that, that that's possible for as well, but I'm just concentrating on the lamb ones for the moment. And the intention there is to make sure that we keep on improving the growth rate and the leanness and the muscling, but we maintain the intramuscular fat levels. Uh, we maintain the iron, zinc, um, possibly even omega-3s, things like that. And genomics is a part of that. Um, broader industry challenges, uh, the two main ones I'll touch on there, um, the welfare issues of things like tail docking, use of chemical drenches, that sort of stuff, which I suspect are fairly common to your industry uh, or similar with you, you guys. They're increasingly issues that we're working on at, at a whole of industry uh, level. Um, I think some of you will be aware that some uh, breeders in this country are now uh, taking account of things like worm counts and so they can get EBVs for uh, worm counts so we can breed sheep that don't need drenching. Um, and uh, lamb survival is also something of increasing interest. So making sure the lambs can be born safely and that they've got real get up and go and uh, they're not going to die out in the paddock. So there's some examples of genetics impacting welfare. And just getting back to the issue of benefits uh, through the whole chain, the, the whole issue of payment systems is increasingly uh, evolving. Uh, people are using some new technology in the processing plant um, things like Viascan to try to get more information about the yield and uh, the fatness and so forth of the carcass and start to provide payment back to the producer uh, that's more fine-tuned, more calibrated to, um, to the value of the carcass. That's a slow, steady progress, uh, a, a process. Um, it's, uh, it's not easy for the processors necessarily to get the benefits back out of that but there's certainly uh, research going on and people trialling that sort of thing. Um, so there's plenty of R&D continuing across the, the whole front of, um, of the lamb industry, but from a genetics perspective, I'd say the, the big focus, uh, in addition to what we've all, always been doing, is on uh, eating quality, using genomics generally to help us with things that are hard to measure, uh, and really improving welfare-related things wherever we can. Um, Reid will be able to tell you about, uh, there, there's an industry strategy, whole of industry strategy document. It's uh, not unlike your roadmap. Um, and that's something that keeps evolving, but roughly speaking, every five years. And that tries to maintain that whole of industry focus, which I talked about back early on in the, 
the presentation that it's not just, oh, we've got some great genetics research going on and nothing else is happening, or we've got some great marketing and nothing else is happening. It's trying to make sure that we're identifying problems and uh, developing solutions for them across the, uh, uh, the whole industry and try to make sure that, that those things are coordinated um, and integrated in terms of how they're put in place. Um, I think this is my second last or last slide. And I just want to sort of reinforce a couple of points. The, the real challenges that I think are our learnings from that change process that started back in the late 1980s, first of all, you've got to do whatever you can to get the whole of industry um, working together. And I've, I've kind of made a special point there, different sectors must lead together one way or another, every single sector in our industry, some people had to try something new. They had to... Um, uh, breeders were kind of going out a bit on a limb, breeding uh, animals that were going to be leader, leaner. Producers were going out a bit on a limb, selling lambs that were leaner than that was what the traditional markets expected people trying new markets that with new products. They were all taking it, doing something a bit new, taking a bit of a risk. And um, so it wasn't any one particular sector that took all the risk, but it was important that, that people tried what they could do from their own perspective, their own part of the chain, uh, and they talked to each other, the different sectors needing to talk together and try new things together. So that's my first point that... Um, I, uh, I'd stress it's a whole of industry. Um, just confirming the chat thing. I can't see anybody else's chats except Angela and Delaware just wrote test. So getting back to the slide, this is really just an extension of the first point. The, the sorts of changes that the industry's been through could have only happened if people tried to identify benefits for all players, not just one sector. It wasn't just the breeding sector that got some benefit out of this or the retail butchers. And that's part of that work on supply chain development. It was really trying to get people from the different sectors together to see what each of them could get out of the changes. So if they were producing larger, leaner lambs, how did that affect the producer? How did it affect the processor? How did it affect the retail butcher? What did they need to do to make sure that if there was a risk, that risk was mitigated? How did they, what did they have to do to make sure they got something of benefit? And that's really, really important. And that work that was done by people, small projects in which that involved the producer, and in your case, the packer, the, um, the feeder, the butcher, helping people understand their interests, how they could help each other, what they needed to do to make sure they got a benefit. Um, that was absolutely vital. Um, and the last point I think is kind of obvious, and I apologise, it is so obvious, but the whole thing is about consumer focus. It's no good saying, oh, consumers don't want so much fat, but hey, that's what we produce, or you know, we don't get paid for producing lean lambs. It's if the producer doesn't want it, you end up not having a product at all. You don't get returns. That's what we were doing in the 1980s. We were producing what we were able to produce because it suited us, and the consumer simply did not want it. They were walking away from it. So one way or another, you must find out what the consumer wants and try to give it to them. That depends on making sure everybody in the chain understands the effect of that on them, how, what they need to do, how to mitigate their risk. Um, so the change, um, just let me check, I think that might be the last slide, yeah. I really want to stress that um, I think very big changes were made in the Australian lamb industry. They've been very, very valuable. Genetics was a really, really big part of it. I don't think the changes would have happened had genetic change not occurred. But just having breeding programs, just using NSIP, for instance, on its own would not have been enough. It was really important that everybody else in the chain was involved in learning how to get the benefit out of the larger, leaner lambs that were being bred. And the net result is that more and more of those animals are being produced and 
the consumer is uh, responding in the way they do. They pay good money for lamb, and not just in Australia, not just in America, everywhere, people like the large lean lamb. Let me just check the questions. Um, how is this information shared with breeders? Shaman's question. If you're talking about my information, um, the sort of stuff I've just been through, land plan information is, is directed, disseminated direct to all the breeders who use land plan. Um, more widely through the industries, there are lots of field days and workshops and small projects that involve the producers, they might involve the feeders, uh, the processors where possible, just to try to make sure everybody's aware of what's going on and how they can get out of it. Um, all the sheep genetics information's uh, on the, um, the web, uh, heaps and heaps of information, and increasingly the breeders are, are really key part of the communications as well. So I hope that's the answer, that, or that answers Sharman Culligan's question. Susan's just asked, has just as much progress been made with maternal traits and maternal breeds? Um, in the, the main traits that the maternal breeds have concentrated on has been uh, basically the number of lambs weaned and in the breeds where wool is important also the value of the wool because that kind of contributes to the cost of production. And the answer is um, it didn't start quite as early as the changes in terminal size, so the growth rate and muscling and leanness. But uh, pretty much from the mid-90s onwards, there's been very, very good progress in the maternal breeds, usually for a combination of growth rate of their lambs and the, uh, the weaning rate that's being achieved. So breeds like Border Leicester, Corridale, Coopworth, um, and the entire Merino sector Yes, they've been making very good progress, but it's across a broader range of traits. It's not just the growth and, and leanness and muscling. Merinos really took off after about uh, 2000, which is where we, we really upped our effort in, um, uh, in Merinos. So uh, the answer to, to Susan's question about maternal breeds and traits is, uh, as long as you take account of the fact, the fact that it's a different balance of traits, um, the answer is yes. Um, we're continuing to work on improving the uh, EBVs for particularly reproduction traits and I'd, I'd stress there that the, um, the care of recording is just so important. Um, it's, it's absolutely essential that you have whole of flock recording so the animals that don't have a lamb are recorded just as accurately as the ones that do. But so, yes, people are making really good progress in the, that, what you might call the, the maternal combination of traits. Um, the next question from Bill Duffield. Good day, Bill. Is intramuscular fat, it's intramuscular fat. Um, so that's, mu it's what in beef is called marbling fat. Is that done by ultrasound or is there a blood test? Um, we're currently doing that by actual uh, dissection of the carcasses, testing the meat and developing a genomic test for it. And so that's how that's being done at the moment. Breeders are submitting the blood samples on their rams. They're going off and being genotyped and the genotype is, is combined with other information to produce an EBV. We do not have scanners of sufficient accuracy to measure marbling fat in this country. Um, the next question from Jim Morgan, has Australia seen any breed or size specific differences in omega-3 levels? Um, I might have to get back to you on, uh, to just check that I get this right, but the big difference in omega-3s is, is dependent on feeding system. Animals that have come off grass have higher omega-3s than uh, animals that don't. I think there might be small differences and they might, strangely enough, be in favour of merinos, basically because they tend to be a bit older when they're slaughtered, and so they've essentially had a chance to accumulate more omega-3 that they've got from the grass. I will get back to you on that question, Jim, and I'll send it via Susan and, and Bill. Dave Pethick is the uh, person I'll be checking that with, so I'll follow up on that. Um, 
and Jim's just commented on polypase and cotardins. Um, yeah, okay. I, th I, I won't try to tell you the, what I think the answer about the, the omega-3s is, but I suspect there might be small differences between terminal sire breeds and the maternal breeds and I suspect it reflects fat distribution because the omega-3 I think gets stored in the fat but I please don't go off and say oh Rob Banks said XYZ and it's true I'll follow up and check on that um, I've finished my slides I hope it was interesting I'm kind of going to wait instructions from Susan and Reid as to what you want to do next I think the answer to Ryan Laurie's question, I assume, is yes. The one about corridors. Uh, Susan's question about parasite resistance EBVs. Um, well, uh, fairly simple. I think the, uh, the question is there are parasite resistance EBVs available in all breeds that are using Lamplan or Merino Select in Australia. And they're based on counting uh, worm eggs in the faeces of a sheep. So you take a faecal sample and send it off to a lab and uh, they count the eggs. Um, their heritability of parasite resistance or basically of worm egg count is something like 27%. So if you measure it, you can get quite useful EBVs and people have been using it more particularly in the merinos and in recent years uh, some of the uh, dual purpose breeds um, and very, very successfully. There are, I live in a part of the country where uh, Hemonchus is a problem, Hemonchus contortus, and uh, there are breeders here in Merinos who've been using uh, parasite resistance EBVs to breed sheep that just do not need um, drenching at all now. So uh, I don't know what uh, facilities you'd have in the States for getting the same measurements, but I'm sure we can help you identify what needs to be done. And if you get those, you can breed sheep that do not need drenching and don't get worms. Um, thank you, Cody, for your um, comment there about the presentation. Um, Jim's commented about um, Katahdin having EBVs. I presume that's for, um, for worms. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, and Cody's just put a link up about the EBVs, including faecal egg count. Um, I'm in your hands, Susan and Cody, I think.
Um, just quickly going through the... Uh, I'll put my email address in here, B A N K S oh. B A N K S at UNE.edu.au. That's my email address. Now, um, Paul Lewis has just asked how the CRC is set up and the participants. I'll just quickly comment on that, but I'm happy to provide information about it. The CRC is set up because a bunch of research organisations get together with a program of work that they would like doing and they've uh, consulted with industry to make sure that it meets um, industry's needs. So it's a research program essentially and they uh, cost that program. Um, so let's say they put together a bunch of projects, identify the projects, develop up the plans for them, and just for, a, just for an example number, let's say um, they identify the total cost of that as a million dollars, but that if they had more money they would do a certain amount more. They then make an application to the CRC funding program in this country, which is a federal, federal government R&D program, and if it's successful application, uh, the federal government adds some money. Um, and there's been a sheep CRC in place now for, um, well, the, the one that's just finishing has been in place for seven years. And that's been really, really important for the lamb industry because it's, it's, it's had a thing called the information nucleus that uh, has, helped us with the genomic, uh, developing genomic testing. It's got about seven or eight major R&D providers as participants and it's just received an extension. So it's got the State Departments of Agriculture in Western Australia, South Australia, I think Victoria, New South Wales, the University of New England, and then a range of industry partners as well. Um, if people want some detail about the CRC, probably the best way is to follow up uh, with some um, with some st uh, stuff direct from the CRC. Thank you. 